All right. So people will begin to gather in. Let's have a little bit more coffee. Now I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> have you done many of the like? Have you done presentations live? Or on, um, has that been? Yeah. Typical. Yeah, it's not the same as doing it in person, but yeah, I've done. I've done a couple and I've done some lecturing, which is a strange experience as well because you can't right. see anyone. <laughs> right. Um, and you so rely on kind of the students that, there. <laughs> right. And you rely on that kind of feedback, don't you? Like from how people yeah. are engaged. <clears throat> we did one where we did kind of there's a feature we can do breakout rooms where it like splits people into small groups and then they can chat about things and then come back and present to the wider group. And I think that worked much better. So I guess it kind of simulates like a, a classroom a bit more. Yeah. So there's ways technology is getting there, but it's it's fairly. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm looking forward to teaching in person again now and presenting because I think it, you just get much more from it. Yeah. Um, so for those who've joined us, we're just waiting for others, um, others to join. And we'll start with an introduction. So hang tight, get some tea if you need <laughs> so we'll wait maybe 30 more seconds or so um, virginia you said uh in-person teaching will you be back in kings are you doing sort of a, um yeah so i'll be back um i think i'll be back in late july actually which is a bit earlier than i thought but my partner's been offered a job back in the uk and then King's has said that they think that they'll be in person teaching from September. Okay, so that's yeah. good. Academic year yeah. started. Good. Yeah. Uh, they said that, you know, there might still be some restrictions in place, like who are people and masks, but that's fine. I've kind of got used to that now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, okay. So I think we can start. So, welcome to those joining us. Um, hello. Um, this session today is the latest in CENTOC's series of speaking events. Um, it's called CEN Explain. So it's in partnership with experts and lay people and everyone in between to discuss uh, special um, topics and special educational needs. Um, and CENTOC, we are a charity based in South London with an aim to improve social and emotional outcomes for children and young people with SEN, particularly autism and ADHD and their families. So today we're delighted to have Dr. Virginia Carter Lino here to present about the environmental factors that might be linked to mental health difficulties in autistic youth, particularly the impact of stressful life events. And following her talk today, which will last around 30 to 40 minutes, there'll be a question and answer session for another 10 to 15. And, and Virginia's put together some um, questions to engage everyone. So I'd love to see um, a conversation going there. So uh, feel free to ask questions at any time during the event today by typing in the chat box to the right. It should be functional for you. Um, and then a recording of the webinar today will be available on our YouTube page um, immediately, af immediately after the session ends today. So you'll have access um, to go back and watch if you choose. So um, yeah, so I'd now like to introduce Dr. Virginia uh, Cardellino. So Virginia is a Sir Henry welcome postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Her research focuses on the overlap of mental health difficulties and autism, so specifically trying to understand the reasons behind higher rates of mental health difficulties in autistic as compared to neurotypical youth, and delineate which factors might increase for or protect against mental health difficulties in autistic children and adolescents. So uh, welcome, Virginia. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, I'll hand you the floor now. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. Um, I did come and present, it's my second time presenting at CEN Talks, but um, the first time was a while ago, and, and I, I think I came and presented on some of my PhD research, which was focused on the same thing, but I think it, um, I'll, I'll kind of get into more detail as to how my thinking's changed a little bit. Again, it was focused on the kind of predictors of mental health in autistic children. So I thought I'd just start um, with this picture because it kind of uh, encapsulates the approach I'm hoping to take towards understand, understanding mental health and autistic children in that there are many different 
strands or threads which will contribute to a child's good or bad um, kind of mental health, so mental health difficulties or or mental well-being. And so I think what, what really needs to be done is research needs to move um, to kind of thinking about these different threads and, and how they come together um, to contribute to uh, kind of well-being or difficulties in mental health. And I think one important thread of that is environmental factors, which um, have been a little bit overlooked thus far, in my opinion, anyway. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, this is just a quick kind of um, summary, but I feel like uh, I don't really need to go into this too much. Um, but just to highlight that the prevalence of mental health difficulties are much higher uh, in autistic youth. And um, this is actually um, the group I worked with in my PhD uh, at King's, Professor Emily Simonoff, which is the Child and Adolescent Department at King's. Um, and so what they did here was uh, took what they call a population representative sample. And so that's important because um, what they tried to do was find uh, everyone, <clears throat> a population that was representative of uh, all 10 to 14 year olds in a given geographical location. So I think it was um, the borough of Southwark who, uh, had been given a diagnosis of autism and so and then looked at the prevalence of mental health problems in this group and that's important because if you've done um, this study but you've just gone to the clinic so we have strong links with the Michael Rutter Centre for example or um, there are other clinics in South London then you're probably going to see a sample of autistic children who um, have kind of the most severe mental health difficulties and so it might uh, overestimate um, the prevalence of mental health um, diagnoses or difficulties in autism but actually when you use what we call a representative sample so <clears throat> we didn't go to the clinic we didn't search out kind of people who already had mental health difficulties we just asked a sample that was representative of um, autistic youth age 10 to 14 you can see that the rates of um, emotional behavioral problems are kind of nearing 70 percent and we can compare that so this is people who met diagnostic criteria for an additional mental health um, difficulty. So it's not just um, kind of low level symptoms, but <clears throat> actually meeting DSM criteria. And if we compare this to similar population representative samples around the same age, but of neurotypical youth, you can see that the prevalence for uh, mental health difficulties is about 10%. So that's obviously a massive jump. Um, and I think before this, the focus of autism research had really not been on mental health. Um, <clears throat> had been on understanding kind of the, the key factors or contributors to autism. Whereas when this work started getting going, I think it really highlighted to people that <clears throat> actually there was this unmet need um, in autistic youth because a lot of them were experiencing mental health problems and this just wasn't really being picked up. So now I think the field, um, which is great, is really shifting towards um, recognizing that mental health difficulties are an important thing to think about in autism, an important thing to research and something that time and time again, autistic people um, and their caregivers highlight as something they would like to see more research and kind of uh, better understanding of. So that's just to set the scene for, for why it's important to think about um, the drivers of mental health difficulties in autistic youth because they are quite prevalent. And then this is just getting into the types of mental health problems. So in this study of 10 to 14 year olds, um, I don't have ADHD on there, but the most common ones were anxiety and disorders. So that's kind of can, uh, can be um, generalized anxiety disorder or social phobia or uh, separation anxiety. So all anxiety disorders um, were lumped in there and that about 40% of the sample met criteria for an anxiety disorder. Then we have ADHD, and I think that was about 30%. <clears throat> and then we have what um, different people call, uh, so these are the diagnostic terms, so that's oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, but are often referred to as externalizing behaviors or behaviors that challenge. Um, so these are kind of the types of behaviors which are, are most prevalent. And then I just wanted to highlight that, you know, people are now taking this up and doing uh, more recent research. So this is a meta-analysis um, published last year. So a meta-analysis is where you um, scan through the literature and pull together all the studies that have, um, all the papers or the projects that have um, looked at your question of interest. So here they wanted to know, uh, they looked for all the papers that had looked at um, prevalence of mental health um, problems in autistic people. 
And so that's slightly different from autistic youth, but it's helpful because it scans, brings together all of the literature. So uh, you can see the kind of first column here. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but the first column where it says number of data points in meta-analysis, that's the number of studies that have gone into um, this work here. So you can see it's actually quite a lot of research, um, quite a few studies. So 89 have looked at the prevalence of ADHD, 68 have looked at the prevalence of anxiety disorders, and then I've just highlighted um, in blue uh, kind of externalizing problems, so about 50. And you can see here that the, the pool prevalence, which is where they look at the prevalence from all these studies, so you know you can always make an argument. If you just do one study, there might be things that contribute to your findings which um, you hadn't foreseen, there might be a bias in your sample, there might be um, some way that you ask the question has kind of biased the results. But here, because they're pooling so many studies together, it actually gives you a pretty reliable estimate of the prevalence. And again, it's kind of matching what um, the study I presented before by Emily Simonoff. So uh, ADHD is about 30%. Anxiety disorders actually lower about 20%. But you can see here we've got the kind of range of potential values, and it's going from 2% to 48%. So, you know, it could be... Um, the true value lies somewhere within those two numbers. And then for externalizing problems, um, again, 12% and somewhere between zero to 36%. So this is just really highlighting that, um, yeah, mental health problems are, are prevalent in, this was in autistic people, not autistic youth, but, um, and this is something that uh, needs to be better understood. So I kind of spoke to Valenza about this. Um, we had a chat before and, in um, neurotypical research, the environment is often a real focus of interest in terms of um, mental health. So, so many papers are published looking at um, yeah, the environment the child lives in and how that impacts on their mental health. And this is something which doesn't seem to be or wasn't so much the case in um, autism research for a long time. And so I think for a while it was... Um, a lot of the research focused on the kind of intrinsic child factors, um, I'll get to that, which um, might have contributed to poor mental health, but kind of less acknowledgement of the fact that the child lives within an environment. That, so, you know, we all are part of an environment and that will impact on our on our day to day experiences. Um, and so what I wanted to do is try and think about can we kind of shift and um, pull some of that focus from the neurotypical mental health research and situate it within um, when we think about mental health in autism. And so one of the kind of most focused uh, factors, environmental factors, is stressful life events. And there have been some very elegant studies in neurotypical research which have um, basically shown that they do have a causal role in um, kind of contributing to poorer mental health later down the line. So kind of twin studies where you can adjust for um, genetic differences and um, so I think that's a fairly accepted factor um, um, that's not good for your mental health if you experience um, stressful life events. And so these can range from um, how they're defined is, is quite broad, but things that are kind of adverse or negative are kind of experiences that are um, yeah, not, not something you particularly want to, to experience um, and may have an impact on your mental health. And so what I've done here is I just had a look and basically, some papers have um, found that certain stressful life events are actually more prevalent in autistic populations. So this is also really important to think about because it might be that um, actually some of the kind of increased prevalence in mental health could be explained by the fact that some stressful life events are also more prevalent in autistic populations. So here I've just highlighted some um, kind of stress, some uh, classic stressful life events that people are researching, and the ones in yellow are the ones where research has shown that they're more prevalent um, in autistic populations. So I've put, <laughs> so parental divorce is um, often kind of conceptualized as a stressful life event, but I put some parental divorces because I don't think all parental, all divorces are a negative um, experience. So I've just couched that there. So then we have a parent having a serious mental illness, death um, of a family member, serious illness in the, in the individual, so the child having to go to hospital or, or being very unwell for a long period of time, witnessing or being involved in natural disaster, bullying, victimization, childhood abuse, sexual coercion. Um, so these kind of range from very extreme to things that unfortunately, um, such as bullying, do happen to a large proportion of children. 
So then <clears throat> having thought about, okay, so there's this really interesting stressful life events in neurotypical research, and they seem to have a lot of support as um, kind of a, a causal factor in um, having a negative impact on mental health, but how many people had actually looked at it in uh, autistic children? And so, as I said, there's been much more focus on intrinsic or child factors such as uh, IQ, the kind of level or um, type of autism symptoms, verbal skills. Um, so this is really shifting the focus to, to think about the environment. So these are studies I found. I'll note that they weren't actually very many. <laughs> um, so some studies had looked at the association between stressful life events and internalizing symptoms. So I'm just going to um, introduce the terms and then I'm going to use these throughout. So internalizing symptoms, I'm talking about things like anxiety and depression. So things that are kind of internal to the child um, aren't necessarily noticeable to an outside observer. So two studies had looked at this here. So one by Gazudin, um, which was quite an old study, and they had looked at exit events, um, which is uh, a kind of, I guess, like the politer way for someone in the family dying. Um, so these, they compared uh, autistic people who um, did and did not have uh, depression and found that exit events were more prevalent in the group who were depressed. So that's some evidence, but there are only 22 participants, which is very low, and they only looked at depression. And this is just one specific type of um, stressful life event. Then there was another study in 2017, so a bit more recent by Connor Kearns and colleagues. And here they focused on, focused on adverse child experiences in like a big um, US sample where they collect this type of information fairly regularly. And here they also found an association between stressful life events and internalizing symptoms. But I had a look and the type of um, kind of adverse child experience are quite severe. So neighborhood violence, domestic violence, drugs in the home. And you could also say um, for the two that looked at associations between stressful life events and externalizing symptoms, that the, the kind of the same thing is true. So they looked at maltreatment in an inpatient setting, one study in maltreatment, including physical abuse. So these are pretty extreme um, adverse life events. And so what I wanted to look at was what about the kind of uh, more everyday up and down changes within a family's environment or a child's environment. So, you know, some, some individuals will experience some of these adverse, more severe adverse child experiences, but a large proportion will not. Um, and there hadn't really been much thought to kind of yeah the the more quotidian everyday experiences and how that's impacting on a child's mental health. Also, I would note that some of these are inpatient settings or um, U.S. samples, so not kind of applicable to um, autistic children from the U.K. who are not in an inpatient setting, you know, are going to school or um, are at home. So it's kind of hard to, to pull the research findings and, and see how they would be relevant to um, these type of autistic children. Also, these are all cross-sectional. So that just means that all of these things were measured at one point in time. So these type of studies are really helpful because it tells us if there's an association. So for example, the study on exit events, you know, the, the fact that exit events are more depressed in people, uh, autistic people who um, are more prevalent in autistic people who are depressed versus autistic people who aren't depressed tells, might tell us something, but it doesn't really tell us if experiencing stressful life events actually impacts on your future mental health um, yeah, at a future time point. And that's what you really need to know to establish um, or have some evidence, even a hint of it for causality. And if we're going to um, establish a research base, you really want things to be robust um, and strong evidence that stressful life events do impact on mental health, um, because that's what you need for, for example, policy or, you know, uh, thinking about intervention is a really robust evidence base. So having kind of read through the literature, I did think there was a bit more, um, definitely room for more to be done. Um, so as I said, kind of thinking about things, stressful life experience, which are not quite so extreme as these ones and might be applicable to a wider group of, of children, um, and also thinking about longitudinal um, data collection. So not just looking at one point in time, but actually looking at multiple time points so you can see how things are kind of impacting um, and interacting with each other. So I hope that all makes sense so far. 
So then the other thing to think about is um, the studies that had thought about, I just looked at uh, things at one point in time. So the kind of implicit assumption here is that stressful life events are causing mental health difficulties. But actually the reverse could also be true um, and has found to be true in neurotypical um, children. So it's not just that stressful life events um, contribute to poorer mental health, but actually poorer mental health means that you are more vulnerable to go on to experience more stressful life events. Um, so I think in this paper, they give the example of, um, I think it was bullying and victimization, but, but something stressful um, in a child's environment, which then led them to have uh, more mental health difficulties. But actually having these mental health difficulties meant it was very hard for them to um, kind of reintegrate with the friendship group and they were kind of picked out as being different and then they're more likely to be bullied. Um, so you can see that there's kind of a bi-directional uh, or a circular relationship between these things. And the only way to really disentangle um, what's going on there is with a longitudinal design, because then you can look at how things are contributing to each other over time. Whereas if you just look at one point in time, it could be stressful life events are contributing to mental health, but it also could be true that the mental health difficulties that these autistic children are experiencing are actually making them more vulnerable. And that's why they have a higher prevalence of stressful life events. So that brings us to the kind of questions of interest for this study. <clears throat> so my first question were, are there associations over time between internalizing and externalizing symptoms and stressful life events? I've just changed it to SLEs, just in terms of uh, saving space, but that's what I'm referring to. So that would be um, this dark blue arrow here. So is uh, having mental health problems, does that mean you're more likely to experience stressful life events in the future, but also the reverse? And this is actually the one I think we're really interested in. Are there associations over time between stressful life events and mental health problems? So I'm just, so we kind of split mental health problems into internalizing and externalizing symptoms because put, putting them together, they're kind of quite different things. So anxiety and depression, and then um, kind of challenging behaviors and conduct difficulties. So we split them out in these analysis because it could be that actually stressful life events are much more um, important for predicting one or versus the other. And that would be really important to know uh, clinically or for kind of policy recommendations. And then this final point, um, which is kind of, I'll, I'll get on to explain a bit more, but are pathways from stressful life events to mental health problems moderated by individual levels of cognitive flexibility? So this is because we started thinking about this because, again, in the neurotypical research literature, there's a lot of thought that's gone on to um, risk and protective factors. So you know, not everyone who experiences a stressful life event goes on to develop mental health problems. And people have started to question, well, why is that? And so it might be that certain individuals are somehow buffered from the, um, the kind of experience or from um, the impact of stressful life events. So these are things such as, I'm just trying to think from the, the typically developing literature, things like uh, having a strong, strong social support network. Um, so having people you can, you can talk to if, when something like this happens. Um, but also within the child, things such as um, IQ, but also cognitive flexibility. So <clears throat> based on the neurotypical literature, we would hypothesize that the association between stressful life events and mental health problems would be stronger in children who have more difficulties in cognitive flexibility. So I'll just go um, over cognitive flexibility as a concept, uh, and then I can start talking about some of these analyses. So what is cognitive flexibility and why would it be relevant um, to thinking about the impact of stressful life events? So cognitive flexibility is our ability, our, uh, um, yeah, ability to adapt our behavior and thinking in response to the environment. So I'll just give some examples here. It's defined in lots of different ways, but essentially consider multiple perspectives, change our approach to um, solving a problem, shifting our attention between two concepts or ideas, updating our responses when the environment changes or rules change, just flexibility in the way we think and behave. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so I give the example of <clears throat> um, a child going to school the same way every day, take the same bus, and um, one day there's some road work, as there always are in South London, and the bus has to go a separate way. And someone who um, might, has difficulty in cognitive flexibility might find this actually quite stressful 
because uh, it's harder for them to adapt their behavior and thinking in response to this environmental change. And so this is particularly relevant to um, autistic people as researchers demonstrated that this is one particular area of cognition that they might have real difficulty with. And then bring it back to, okay, but why is that relevant to stressful life events? Well, actually, if you think about um, cognitive flexibility in terms of being able to rethink and shift your perspective, if you have difficulties with this, then um, you're much more likely to ruminate and get stuck on a topic or an idea. And in neurotypical um, research, this um, basically, if you have good cognitive flexibility, it kind of buffers you against the impact of stressful life events because you can reframe, you can shift your thinking. Whereas if you have difficulty in cognitive flexibility, when something bad happens to you, you might be more likely to kind of ruminate and stay stuck on it and think about what happened to you. And, and that in turn will contribute to um, mental health difficulties kind of later down the line. So that's why I thought that this was an important individual factor to um, also bring in to the analysis. And going back to the, the metaphor with the strands, I think <clears throat> what's important, um, what they, um, the neurotypical research has, has kind of highlighted is it's not just thinking about environmental factors, but also child factors and how they kind of weave together and how they might shift uh, a child's likelihood of um, experiencing good or poor mental health. So thinking about the two things together. So there's kind of a lot going on. And so I needed to find a data set that had um, sufficient measurement of all of these things um, in autistic children, which was actually surprisingly quite hard to find. So I've worked with the, the Pathways in Autism Spectrum Disorder sample, which is a Canadian sample, started up quite a long time ago um, across multiple sites in Canada. And so the reason I kind of turned to this sample is because they had measured the concepts I was interested in at multiple time points and they had a lot of children take part in the sample. So to, to look at these things um, <clears throat> and be sure that your conclusions are robust and not found by chance and would replicate, you need to have as many people as possible taking part in your sample. Um, also, it just means your sample is more representative, kind of the more people that take part, the better, because then you have a real mix of people. Um, so here, children, autistic children, uh, and you can be more sure that your research is, is representative and isn't just because you ended up with a very select, small sample of people. Um, so, yeah, the Pathways team very kindly um, agreed to collaborate on this and uh, we kind of worked on this together. So I'll just talk you through the, the sample. So it was what they call an inception cohort. So they approached people um, who had a child who just received a diagnosis of autism and asked them if they'd like to take part in the study. So when the children entered the study, they were between two and five years old um, and had all received a diagnosis of autism in the last four months. And you can see here they had about 420 people take part, which is a very impressive number. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so that was when they were younger and then if we shift down the line to when I started looking at the data um, at time point five when they were age seven there's about 300 so they have had some dropout uh, and then they saw them kind of every year after so they saw them when they were seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is great because you can imagine you can get a really detailed picture of what's going on in the kind of fluctuations um, of the everyday kind of child's experience and their mental health over this time point. So this is kind of what um, was measured at each time point. Um, so we have parent rated family stressful life events. So parents, um, I'll talk you through the measure, but rated things that were going on in their family in the last six months. And then we have teacher rated mental health difficulties for the child. This is when they're age seven, eight, nine and ten. And so the reason we use teacher rated rather than parent rated is we were thinking that if parents were kind of very stressed and had experienced a lot of stressful life events, this might actually uh, impact how they rated their child's behavior. So just so thinking of um, one example. So one example of the literature is um, if you think about, so you're interested in parental uh, mental health and how that impacts on child mental health, which is a really important um, research area. But if you used, uh, if you ask the parent to rate their mental health and then rate their child's mental health, it's probable that the parents who have uh, experiencing really poor mental health and are really struggling 
are going to rate their children um, potentially more negatively by virtue of the fact that they themselves are experiencing mental health difficulties. And so the same thing could be true here. Parents could rate their, their child's behaviour, their mental health as worse, just because the environment is very stressful at the moment and they're feeling a bit overwhelmed. And so this then kind of biases um, your uh, estimation of the association between these two things. And as I said before, what we really need is to have really kind of robust and strong evidence that there is an association between stressful life events and mental health in autistic youth, which can't be explained by any sort of bias or uh, the way we've measured things or how people have been asked to report on things. So that's why we use teacher rated instead, because it kind of removes that issue. You know, it could be that uh, teachers who are more stressed rate their, their children um, in their class kind of as having poor mental health, but that's not really going to relate to our predictor here, which is family rated uh, stressful life events. So, and then at age seven, we also have parent rated cognitive flexibility. So I'll just quickly talk through what we ask parents, because I think that would be helpful. So in terms of stressful life events, um, parents completed the family inventory of life events and changes, which assesses uh, whether 71 normative and non-normative stressful life events have been experienced by the family unit. Oh, sorry, I said six months, but it's the previous 12 months. So here you can see it's kind of, yeah, more normative and less extreme everyday um, stresses. Uh, so into family strains, marital strains, work, family transitions, illness, family care. Um, so the type of things that might actually happen to a fair number of, um, of families. And then the teachers. So we asked them, they completed the child behavior checklist, um, which is a fairly established uh, measure of mental health and difficulties in children. And so um, we focused here on the internalizing subscale. So that's items from anxious, depressed, withdrawn, depressed, and somatic complaints. So that's probably a level of details a bit too much, but <laughs> um, essentially anxiety and depression type symptoms. And then externalizing subscale, uh, rule breaking behavior, aggressive behavior. Um, so kind of conduct, behavior problems, challenging behavior type symptoms. And then in terms of cognitive flexibility, parents completed a measure called the brief, which is very widely used um, uh, questionnaire which measures executive functioning in real world settings and here because we're interested specifically in cognitive flexibility this was measured by the shifting subscale so this assesses a child's ability to move freely from one situation activity or aspect of a problem to another as a situation demands transition solve problems flexibly um, <clears throat> and here uh, just because we were interested in Kind of the differences between children who had um, kind of typical shifting versus real problems and shifting ability we divided them um, with a t-score of 65 which is essentially marking out the questionnaires marking out individuals with clinically significant difficulties in shifting so these are the, the two groups we had so back to our original question so the first thing we're going to ask is um, do family stressful life events Actually, I think the first thing we're going to ask is, do mental health difficulties predict um, family stressful life events? And then we can ask, and do family stressful life events predict mental health difficulties? So this is our first question. So we've got a measurement of all these things across four time points. So starting at seven, going to 10. So we've got a good idea of what's going on every year in these children. So if we start with internalizing symptoms. So the first, uh, oh, actually, what we can look at is we can not only look at how things associate over time, which would be these kind of um, diagonal arrows, but actually we can look at how things um, associate within the same construct. So do stressful life events at one time point predict increased likelihood of exp experiencing stressful life events at the next time point? And you can ask that about internalizing symptoms too. But what we're really interested in is these diagonal arrows. So do internalizing symptoms symptoms at one time point predict stressful life events at the next time point and vice versa. Do stressful time points, stressful life events at one time point predict internalizing symptoms at the next time point. And we run the same model for um, externalizing symptoms. So these are just called um, cross leg panel models. It's just a way of analyzing uh, lots of different paths um, between the same constructs measured repeatedly over time. So, if we start with internalizing symptoms, so we have the within domain prediction. 
So in blue at the top, this is just asking, do stressful life events at one time point predict increased likelihood of experiencing stressful life events one year later? And the answer is yes. So this kind of tells us that there might be some families um, or uh, certain individuals who are really experiencing a lot of stressful life events over this period. Or something about experiencing a stressful life event means you're more likely to experience one in the past, I mean, in the future. Um, and the same with internalizing symptoms. So this suggests some stability. So um, if you experience internalizing symptoms, so anxiety and depression and when you're seven, you're more likely to experience them when you're eight and nine and 10, which kind of fits with what we know about internalizing symptoms. They can sometimes be um, quite stable over time. So then getting into the uh, kind of key questions. So in terms of do internalizing symptoms predict stressful life events? So does it, you know, having symptoms um, of anxiety and depression in an autistic child, does that make them more vulnerable to experiencing stressful life events at a family level? The answer seemed to be no. So this pathway was not statistically significant. And that's why I've done it on that dotted line there. But the reverse, so do, um, does experiencing uh, stressful life events within the family predict um, increased likelihood of having internalizing symptoms one year later? The answer is kind of almost. <laughs> so ideally we want um, for kind of true statistical significance, we, we need a p-value of less than 0 0.05. So we're right on the cusp there. But I would say that we've set up the model to be a very strict test. Remember, we've got teachers rating internalizing symptoms it might be that teachers aren't as good at spotting them as parents, um, but that's just the, the way we chose to measure them to avoid the bias that I talked about earlier. And then here's the interesting bit. So now we look at whether these pathways between stressful life events and uh, internalizing symptoms differ depending on uh, individual differences in cognitive flexibility. So here in the typical shifting ability, so these are children who, as rated by their parents, don't really have any difficulties in cognitive flexibility, can easily shift um, between activities or, or demands. There doesn't seem to be any association here. So this is kind of completely wiped out. Stressful life events are not predicting internalizing symptoms. But in the children who had clinically significant shifting problems, so real difficulties in flexibility, here we can see a very strong effect of um, stressful life events if you experience stressful life events, you're more likely to uh, the child to um, have internalizing symptoms one year later. And this is, is kind of far below our, uh, our kind of critical p-value. So this is telling us that yes, stressful life events do have an impact on um, the child's autistic children's mental health, but it also seems to be important to think about individual characteristics of the child. So now we can just do exactly the same thing for externalizing symptoms. So again, stressful life events seem to be kind of stable. So there are some families who are really ex experiencing a lot of um, stability in their stressful life events over this four year period. Whereas interestingly for externalizing symptoms, there wasn't really a significant pathway. So showing that there's much less stability in externalizing symptoms than in internalizing symptoms. And then if we look at the pathways between them, so actually neither was significant. So, oops. That should be externalizing, not internalizing, sorry. <laughs> in the green, imagine it's externalizing. Essentially, stressful life events did not predict internal externalizing symptoms. Externalizing symptoms did not predict stressful life events. But if we go back and think about, well, what about if we look at the groups who do and don't have difficulties in cognitive flexibility? Again, in the typical shifting ability group, absolutely no associations here. But in the clinically significant shifting problems group, it's not statistically significant, but we're seeing that same pattern as we did with the internalizing symptoms, but with the externalizing symptoms in that those children who have difficulties in shifting problems seem to be the ones who are much more impacted by um, stressful life events. And then uh, I'll just talk you through this graph. I, I just always think it's helpful to show people the actual data points so they can get a feel for what it looks like. So on the left, we have, um, I've just picked kind of two time points um, it's just easier than trying to show them all together. So on the left, we have internalizing here. And on the bottom, we have a uh, yeah, number of internalizing symptoms at time eight. And then on um, the vertical axis here, we have stressful life events at time seven. So 
Then in blue, we have children who have typical shifting ability, so no difficulties. And then in red, we have children who have clinically significant difficulties in shifting. And you can see the blue line is basically much flatter. So there's not much of an associate, well, there's no association there um, between experiencing stressful life events at time seven, and then one year later, the child's internalizing the symptoms. But in red, you can see this line is much steeper here. And this is basically just demonstrating a positive association. So the kind of more stressful life events you're experiencing, the uh, higher your, um, the child's internalizing symptoms are up here. And you can kind of see the same thing with externalizing symptoms, which is here on the right. Um, the blue line's very flat, which is telling us there's no association between experiencing stressful life events and then and externalizing symptoms one year later, but in red, um, there's a positive association there. So basically our findings are telling us that uh, there is an association, we're seeing an association between uh, stressful life events at the family level. And remember, these are kind of more normative, everyday uh, ups and downs of family life and child's mental health difficulties. But it seems that this pathway is kind of uh, moderated or buffered by differences in the children's cognitive flexibility. So how should we think about uh, mental health in autistic children? So I think this research really demonstrates the importance of the environment, including stressful life events. And it's important to think about this builds on all those studies that had looked at things cross-sectionally. This is kind of a more robust um, and kind of extra layer of stronger support which is really highlighting that you know, thinking about stressful life events is important when um, trying to understand the different factors which contribute to uh, good and poorer mental health in autistic children. So, but what about this non-significant pathway between mental health and um, stressful life events, so kind of the reverse? Because in neurotypical research, there's been a lot of examples showing that having mental health difficulties does make you more vulnerable to experiencing kind of negative things in your environment. So why aren't we seeing it here? So one kind of hypothesis is that it's a younger sample. So they were only seven to 10. So there's not much influence a child has at that age over the environments they place themselves in. So, you know, a lot of studies which had found um, that mental health difficulties make you more vulnerable to experiencing stressful life events looked in teenagers. You know, teenagers are much more uh, independent, can decide where they go, set their own schedule. So maybe that's an important difference. And actually in younger children, having mental health difficulties doesn't make you more vulnerable um, because you're younger. It also could be that we asked about family level events. So we asked parents to think about things that had happened in their family over the last 12 months. Um, and, you know, some of the examples I gave were kind of marital strains, work strains, finance uh, changes. It's very hard to see how having a child with mental health, if, well, for some of them you could actually see, but, you know, it's harder to, I think you might be more likely to, to find um, this reverse pathway if you actually ask the children themselves about what they'd experience, which is definitely something that is kind of, should be done in future research. And then the third kind of hypothesis is that pathways are different in autism. You know, some of the things we find, uh, the predictors of mental health that are reported on the neurotypical um, children just might not be relevant. Um, or the pathways to mental health might be different in autism. You know, children with autism, autistic children, their brains have developed slightly differently. Their lives are slightly different. And so this might be reflected in uh, how the environment and mental health relate to each other. For example, it might be that Autistic children um, are kind of, their parents are more planful of their activities. And so actually there, if they are experiencing kind of significant mental health difficulties, it's less likely that they'll go on and experience stressful life events because uh, their parents are kind of planning their activities um, for them. I think also the research really highlights the interactive effects of child and environment. So yes, it's important to think about uh, the environment. So I've got this figure here to kind of um, put across how I think about it. So on the right here, the seesaw, you have the environment. So you've got family and friends, that's meant to be a school <laughs> um, and kind of home life. And that's gonna contribute to, uh, to good or bad mental health. But then you also have individual characteristics of the child themselves and the um, 
kind of intrinsic child factors and then the extrinsic environment are going to kind of work together um, to yeah, can, kind of uh, shift the, the balance towards good or bad mental health within the child. So you've got to think about both. Um, so this is more kind of, we can talk about this in a question for a group, so I think it'd be really helpful to think about this, but I think um, looking into moderating factors, so here we looked at cognitive flexibility, is really important because these could be things that actually buffer um, against uh, negative environmental impacts or other things that might cause mental health, difficulties and so if you can identify some of these things that buffer these children or individuals so make them less likely to uh, develop mental health difficulties if they experience um, a negative life event that's really important because then you can think about oh well, could we de design interventions and um, to kind of promote these buffers um, so in general I think just better understanding of the factors that confer both risk and resilience to mental health difficulties is, is really important and much needed um, in autism research. So where to go next? So here we ask parents about um, the kind of stressful life events that were going on in the family, but actually as these children get older, I think it'd be really important to ask the children themselves what's going on, because there could be things um, that they're experiencing that the parents don't know about. So for example, bullying, or it could be that things parents rate as stressful actually bear no impact on the child. They're not aware of them. It's you know too far removed. And so I think actually asking children themselves is uh, a, good, a good thing to do next. <laughs> um, and also to ask older children. I think as children get older, as I said, they become more independent. They might be more likely that they experience stressful life events or um, kind of negative environmental um, experiences. So I think definitely thinking about and what happens when they get older, does it look different or the same? Um, the final thing is we asked, parents to report on their child's cognitive flexibility. Again, I think if we, um, it might be a kind of important future step is to ask um, children themselves to complete some tasks. So I've called here objective measures of cognition. So instead of asking parents to rate it, actually um, sitting the, the children down and, and asking them to complete some tasks which would measure their cognitive flexibility. Um, because again, it could be that parents' perception of uh, how flexible their child is very different from actually how their child's uh, brain is working, if you like. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly thank everyone. Um, and then I just have a couple of questions, but I think I kind of picked up on them at the end there. So all my collaborators on this work and the, the Pathways in Autism um, cohort, who I collaborated with to, to analyze this data, the Wellcome Trust that fund my research, all the families that took part in the study, but also others I've worked on, the research wouldn't be possible without them, and send talk for the invite. So I've just done a couple of, of questions here, um, which we could talk about, or if you had any questions about the um, what I presented, because there was <laughs> quite a lot in there, then I can uh, answer those. So I'll stop there. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Virginia. That was incredibly comprehensive and thought-provoking. Um, did you want to, should we start by, should we pose some of these discussion points? What do you, what do you, what do you feel? Yeah, unless there were any specific questions about what I presented, I can't see them. I can just see my presentation. Okay. So if there was any clarification that people wanted, otherwise I can kind of go through some of these. Okay. So if um, we don't have any questions at the moment, but for those with us um if you want to sort of send along questions or if you want to share your experiences um that might be interesting but i guess we can we can start with this discussion points and then if we if any questions come along yeah so the discussion points i had were which factors do you think contribute to autistic children's mental health so here we've talked about family level stressful life events quite broadly um so I just wondered if people had insights over particular things they think really impacted their child's mental health. Um, and then are there other buffers we should think about? So I kind of talked about, you can you can see it either way. So with the cognitive flexibility findings, so the, the children with typical um, shifting ability or typical cognitive flexibility, you know, it didn't seem like negative life events were really impacting them that much. So it's almost buffering them from these environmental factors. So I was just wondering if people had any opinions or thoughts on other buffers that maybe I should look into or think more about, um, because I, I do think that delineating kind of, 
not only risk factors, but also resilience factors are really important because that's where you can say, OK, but if we can promote this, then or this characteristic or, or this thing, then it might actually mean that people because you can't stop everyone from experiencing negative life events. You know, that's just mm-hmm. part of life sometimes. But if you can kind of build on or um, promote buffering factors, then it means that when people experience them, actually, they might be um, less impacted by them or, or kind of more mel- well equipped to deal with kind of things like that, especially in autistic children. I just don't think there's been as much thought into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if um, if anyone with us who who is a parent or care would like to kind of contribute, what what do you think is most you know what factors influence um, sort of your your child's mental health um, in in negative ways and positive ways? What have you found that works to buffer against stress? Um, it'd be an interesting conversation. Um, I know Virginia. There's one thing I've been. I'm, I've been studying um, in this role is looking at sort of masking and how masking for a lot of autistic young people, adults, is almost as, as this reflex. And I guess for those that are watching that haven't heard what uh, masking or camouflaging is, it's essentially a it's artificially performing social behavior uh, deemed to be more socially acceptable or hiding um, less socially acceptable behavior. So. I was reading an account this morning. It was from um, uh, a charity based in Australia, Australia that looks at sort of supporting mental health and autistic girls. And um, we know, um, and they're saying it's sort of like an automatic reflex. And it's hard sometimes then to unpick a sense of when am I camouflaging? What's my real sense of self in the social environment? And things like that. And um, yeah, and that seems to, and we see kind of like, I know with our families, we see um, distress behavior and breakdowns. And so um, that's something I'm, we're, we're kind of thinking about is, is masking seems to be maybe an intrinsic part of an ex, part of an experience growing up in a social environment. All of us have to go through school, you know, we have to learn to make friends. And I think, um, I guess it's learning um, kind of what makes maybe what make what might make a child more susceptible uh, to take on masking behavior that's that's um, maybe more problematic for them um, in terms of developing an authentic sense of identity. Um, I don't know. Have Virginia? Have you run into any sort of research with masking, or um, what are your thoughts yeah. there? I've read some um, some papers. A lot of them coming from UCL. Um, about how yeah, it seems to be, especially in autistic women, that um, masking is associated with poorer mental health. Um, so although I guess you've masked your kind of autism characteristics, actually the effort of that is then um, contributes to poorer mental health, especially kind of anxiety and depression. And mm-hmm. to me, I think it's, it, it's an open question whether it's because of the effort of it you know, every day having to think, how do I act in a social situation? How do I cover up this? It sounds so effortful that you can imagine every day it kind of does contribute to poor mental health. Or if it's um, the feeling that you're hiding your true self is such a dissonance. You can imagine if you see yourself one way, but you present this completely different person outwardly, that dissonance between the two selves I think could be very stressful. So it could be both actually, that it's effortful, but also just the idea of having two identities is just very incongruent and not mm. great for positive well-being. Um, mm. So I, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done as to, as you say, everyone kind of masks sometimes, but is it different in autism or is it just that autistic people have to do it so much more because society is basically implicitly suggesting that they do? Um, because society is just not accepting of people who are neurodivergent Mm -hmm. or is it that it's just so much harder to mask if you're autistic I don't know Mm -hmm. because of um, just general differences in the the way the brain's developed is is masking so much more effortful Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there are lots of kind of mechanistic questions or in my mind anyway as to what what it means to mask how how is it done? How does it impact on your sense of self and your mental health over time? That's another mm-hmm. thing, actually, just going back to my kind of 
more boring uh, research hat is that if you look at things at one point in time, you don't know what's contributing to what. So yes, it could be that masking contributes to poor mental health, but also could be that if you're feeling really anxious and depressed or, or kind of um, you have a lot of mental health difficulties, you're more likely to mask because you want to cover up those problems you're having. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do think longitudinal studies are needed to kind of unpick exactly what's going on there. Yeah, I, it, it's quite interesting. We had um, a guest on um, our speaker series a few months ago, uh, Kieran Rose, and he recently participated in some research looking at masking. And he said, um, you know, what really needs to be done done is kind of to understand the social world and kind of how trauma could come from it, how masking could come from it. So it's it's really looking at kind of um like you're saying it's like why why does masking arise um how is it how is it created um it's quite interesting and it seems like at least the pattern in research now is the the understanding of masking as sort of a coping mechanism is well known but um in terms of it being constructed for the autistic community it doesn't it's it's not enough to kind of just say here's here's a coping mechanism but to look at sort of the underlying factor of Okay, why why in the environment? What can we what can we do to shape environments differently to make it more accepting or open? Or is it you know is it around mental health stigma? Is it around um, stigma around neurodiversity? So it's quite interesting. Um, and some things I kind of ran into when I was doing research um, was that um, sort of buffers against stress um, is. Um, uh, recommended from um, this young autistic girl, she's from the National Autistic Society, she mentioned kind of time for rest, time for special interests, and she mentioned something called energy accounting, so kind of, which might sort of work for some people, maybe work, not work for others, but it's writing two lists of what consumes my energy and what sort of builds my energy up, so things like, you know, on uh, the energy consumption side, um, even for a child or a young person, just to have this list to refer to, like, I'm feeling sort of drained today, but I can look at my list on one side and see what can replenish my energy in a different way. Um, but it definitely seems to be maybe internal work that that young person has to do in, in response to kind of stressful environments. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> no question there. But <laughs> um, No, I think it's uh, because it, the, the idea of kind of difficulties in cognitive flexibility, you could say, well, actually, it's that these people, yes, they have difficulties, children have difficulties in cognitive flexibility, but they just need more time to process mm -hmm. things because it, it's kind of more effortful for people to um, switch their behavior or, or switch when something, an environmental change happens to them, they just need more time or it's more effortful that more energy is consumed to kind of process that change. Mm -hmm. um, so I could definitely see how that ties in to what I've been presenting today. Yeah, and um, I guess this whole idea between sort of buffering between one sense of self and self well-being and the world out there, whether it's within the family context or school or kind of the areas of life where a child might perceive to be more stressful is kind of, I guess, putting in those tools that might um, that work best for that child, whether it's sort of visual tools, whether it's sort of writing it down and really seeing it or really making it tangible. Um, uh -huh. I guess it's hard to make sort of general strategy buffer strategies, but um, I guess it's really working on understanding um, how autistic brains might work differently. Um, I think maybe research, I don't know if you find this, but sometimes, you know, maybe research sort of blanket, makes a blanket, um, blanket assumptions on autistic experience and we're finding that autism sort of looks different on every person. So. Um, yeah. I guess the question is, how do we make um, recommendations around mental health and well-being that are not too specific, but also um, <laughs> general enough? Um, that yeah. kind of, um, I think that is the challenge, because to make recommendations, you know, for example, for things to be placed in national guidelines so nice, there needs to be a strong evidence base for it. And generally, that will be done uh kind of based on like group averages. So here, the results I presented were from a large sample, but you know, it's not every autistic person and I'm sure there are individual differences. It's not just cognitive flexibility that probably buffers the impact of the stressful life events. Um, and each individual, they might have their own buffer. You know, not everyone 
finds people have different coping strategies for when they experience stress. That's true in autistic and neurotypical people. But it is hard to translate kind of individual experiences, which are so important, and then square that with kind of you need uh, empirical and robust evidence to take to policymakers and, and clinical services to um, for them to make recommendations based on so yeah, I don't really, right. it's hard for me to square those two but um, yeah. I think if you if, if you have like a clinician will hopefully um, ask you about your individual experiences but I think at the very least just getting people thinking a bit more about risk and resilience um, mm in terms of autistic mental health might then prompt people to ask these questions about um, what are your individual coping strategies? What are the things that your child finds stressful? Um, which I think would be helpful. So even if things are done at a kind of more general level, it might trickle down to individual um, clinicians or policymakers just thinking a bit more about those things. Yeah, I think what you mentioned is really important is um, for um, I know what I witness in my role working with families is oftentimes kids, young people already have coping mechanisms in place before they even realize it's a coping mechanism. So very early on, and this could be things like masking or, um, you know, having certain comfort um, sort of activities that give them comfort, like stimming um, is, you know, uh, allows for emotional regulation in different ways. Um, and yeah, it's a good point is, is maybe asking, um, just making space for those conversations is a, is a really um, interesting um, sort of call to action there is, is kids are already, you know, kids are resilient. Um, people are resilient by nature, especially those ha that have encountered um, adversity in different ways. Um, and I liked what you mentioned about sort of uh, towards the end of different perceptions of stress so like maybe we have we're defining stress in one way and um an individual could look at stress quite differently and and sort of it's asking the right questions on perhaps mental health could look very different from one person to the next or one community as a whole um yeah so that's interesting it makes me think of um a conference i went to recently when there was a session about um Kind of trauma experiences and post-traumatic stress in autistic individuals and some of the research was basically sh presented showing that um, some things that autistic people identified as kind of stressful or, or a trauma event are not things that are kind of in the classic definition of traumatic events and not things that neurotypical people would necessarily identify as stressful and so I think that speaks to your point of asking the individual what has what do you think has prompted um this stress what have you found stressful rather than assuming it will fit in one of these boxes which have been developed from the neurotypical community mm. so I, I do think that work is is happening but it's still very recent though um that that the, those kind of conversations and that that type of research is, is starting to happen absolutely um and, you know, this idea of uh, the spiky profile um, with autistic individuals is sometimes uh, there are strengths here, uh, but uh, and and there are assumptions made uh, on other levels of functioning as well, other levels of capacity. So if someone is labeled with an Asperger's profile, for example, and I know that's no longer in the diagnostic criteria or it's being phased out, but um it's this idea that we sort of make assumptions on the capacities capabilities perceptions of maybe of our autistic young people and and maybe they they sort of look like like you were mentioning about maybe teachers perceptions and what we often see with schools is teachers will kind of miss and think because that child's cope looks like they're coping maybe they're doing fine and um i think it's sort of having that on one's awareness is a capacity you know maybe that buffers against stress could look look okay here but then a capacity against uh, maybe a another stressful event could be completely different depending on maybe that uh, how that person's positioned um their understanding of different experiences and so on um yeah yeah well, this is why I, I would really like to kind of do a similar type of research study but inside the older autistic individuals because then you could ask them themselves so i think 
because the children here were kind of seven to ten, the, they hadn't collected much self-report data at the study, I guess, because they assumed that they were just too young to accurately report on um, kind of what's going around them or their own mental health. But I think if you could do the same thing in, for example, autistic adolescents, then you could just ask the young people themselves what they sound stressful or how their mental health is. And that might give you some real insights as to things that parents and teachers might might have missed because the agreement between kind of self and parent report on things is actually not that high it both in autistic mm. but also neurotypical research um, yeah, it's not as high as, as you would think so mm. and I guess one one last question for me <laughs> so as to not make this discussion so long but um in terms of uh I think they were, was it the parents' report on cognitive flexibility? So their sense of how well their child could adapt. Um, do you think that sort of the supports that are in place, maybe families that have a more, that have the capacity to have maybe more schedule, um, more resources and put in place a schedule for their child, do you think that contributes to cognitive flexibility? So it be, when there is structure, do you think a child is is better equipped to, to adapt or you feel like there's no correlation is there do you think there's a connection between environment or do you think this is sort of an intrinsic skill cognitive flexibility i think it's definitely connected to the environment so we we did think about this and try the only way we could try to address it because i do think it probably is dependent on the family context as well as you said its support system was um, adjusting all of our analyses for social economic status. So we thought maybe families who are less well off might be less equipped or have a, a not so great support system things in place um, because they didn't have the resources to do that. And we didn't really find any differences in the findings. So the results stayed the same, but that it's a very crude weather way of adjusting for family support systems. The other thing it makes me think of is some research um, by Lorcan Kelly, who's now Autistica, where he looked at the correlation between um, child's performance on kind of executive functioning tasks, which are thought to be like an objective measure of how this child's cognitive profile looks, and then mm -hmm. how the children um, fared in like a real life uh, environment where I think there were lots of things changing, I can't remember if it was a classroom or if it was like a, a kind of daily activity to like go out and collect different things, items, and, and maybe something changes in the environment and you see how well the child could um, kind of cope with that change. But essentially, I think the correlation between the kind of controlled lab task measure of cognition and the everyday out and about in the world um, measure was not that high. <laughs> so. Mm. So it clearly is important the environment you are in. Like I'm sure that um, some changes and, and some kind of challenges in the environment are uh, fine for some autistic individuals and then some are very stressful for autistic individuals. And that might not be that well associated with if you kind of ask someone to sit in a quiet room in a research study and do this computer task, you know, the two are very different. So. Yeah, I do think there is something as to the environment you're placed in, the support you have. Are you by yourself? Are you with a family member? Do you, you, you do you have strategies that you've kind of already come up with to deal with these things? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> but I, I also do think that there probably are some intrinsic individual differences um, mm -hmm. in cognition, which probably do play a role. So it's probably a bit of both. You know, in we all have slightly different brains. Um, and that can be true, but then also how we approach or, or encounter or experience different situations, um, you know, dependent on our life experience and our family and our social support, that can also be true. So I think probably both things contribute, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, and while, while you're uh, responding there, it almost made me think of like, um, I think stressors sometimes, if we feel like maybe we're in a healthy, um healthy point uh, and it's maybe it's not the that sort of self-awareness wouldn't be the case for a, a, a very young child but maybe a teenager might be able to save if they feel also sort of healthy and safe maybe this the experience of stressful events would allow sort of like having capacities to 
to learn um, about and problem solve, I guess, within the home. So it allows you to then have to have more understanding about, oh, this is how relationships work, or maybe, you know, life changes and sort of ex- being able to accept life changes a little bit more as a result of stressful events, yeah. as opposed yeah. to if um, a child's sort of grown up in a sort of a nuclear family, um, they might not be so adept when a change comes in their adulthood. Um, that kind of makes me think about it as well as, like you said, it's sort of environment and intrinsic uh, qualities. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think thinking about both is something I definitely would like to try and move towards, even though it's more complicated <laughs> from yeah. kind of a, an analytic perspective and making sure you're measuring things. And I, I think that's how, like, most people experience the world. It's not just like one thing which predicts whether you you have good or bad mental health. It's kind of a variety of different factors acting upon you, and mm. all of your previous experiences, you know, will also impact you. So there's a lot to pick apart. Um, but I think that that's what the kind of field of autistic mental health needs, though, is is to think more about the different factors and how they're contributing. Because then you can isolate. Oh well. If we know a child has experienced X, Y, Z, they might be at more risk for developing mental health problems. So we should really keep a close eye or put things in place preemptively. Or, oh, we know that this individual characteristic or this family characteristic really buffers people um, when they are when they do experience negative life events. So we should try and promote or encourage this characteristic so that when people do experience stressful things, they're kind of more equipped to cope with them. So I, mm-hmm. I hope that's where. Um, the field will move to but um there's a lot more work to be done yeah definitely and across schools um and uh, the work um you know councils do to support families as well um it makes me think about some of the work we do with families in terms of supporting transition um so it, it is stressful to go from sort of primary to secondary and then um you know after um compulsory school age um and so thinking about, I know with uh, young people that have EHCPs, it's maybe a little bit, bit easier to kind of mobilize support during during these um, transition points. Um, and in that sense, you know, a child is, um, you know, you work with the child to kind of say, how do you feel about this change and sort of putting in those support mechanisms. And it makes me think perhaps it could be something a part of the HCP process. It could be a part of teachers um, and parents working together, a SEND department kind of looking at these qualities of flexibility. Um, and then, but yeah, I mean, we always have limitations with resources, with schooling and, you know, time with, you know, family, the, the time that parents have to commit to this. Um, but it, it definitely posits some really interesting questions in terms of how do we better support our children in school as they go as they go on with their lives and, and build capacities that's useful for them. Um, yeah. Good good food for thought. <laughs> um, all right. So I think um, if we have no questions from our attendees, um, I guess we can close it off there. Um, thank you thank so you much s- for inviting me. <laughs> thank you so much. It was um, so informative and nece- necessary to kind of get this view of of uh, mental health in, in autistic youth. And always, I think, yeah, um, using this as sort of call to action, just um, or, or just, you know, positing some of these questions and these concepts in the minds of um, our parents, our professionals, I think is does us all good. So. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and energy. Um, thank you You're for those. Who, um, is is it all right if um, perhaps if our attendees wanted a copy of the slides, uh, they could send yeah, those on? Yeah, that's fine. And actually, if they have any specific questions, please do feel free to email me. I haven't put my email address on there, which is by fault, but you have my email, Valenza. So if, yeah. you know, if there's anything particular that, that comes up or you wanted to ask me about, then please do email me because I'm always happy to, to chat. Great, great, wonderful. Yeah, I'll pass all that on. Um, all right, so we, we'll close it up here. Um, good, good after, or have a good day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll speak again. <laughs> all right. Okay.